my name is Jeanette and welcome to our online gathering. As you know, Reunion is a family of churches in the Boston area with one mission, helping people find their way back to God. Before we begin, let me share with you a few things. First, we would love for you to invite others to the gathering. With one simple click, you can, on YouTube or Facebook, you can invite your friends, your coworkers, your family members, and as you know, Chances are someone you know needs encouragement or is looking for signs of hope during this season. Please go ahead and invite them. And for those of you who are new to Reunion, let me be the first one to welcome you. We'll owe you a hug at some point, but we're so glad that you have joined us online. Our hope is that you can find a community and a family with us, um, a place where you feel belonging and a place where people can walk alongside on your journey. We'd love for you to go on our website, reunionmovement.com, and click on the bubble that says connect with us so that we can get to know you and you have a chance to get to know us. We can follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can find the description below. If you need prayer, please, please text prayer to 617-415-4466. Our staff and elders will love to pray for you. And also, every Sunday, we'll have a weekly prayer on Sundays at 8 p.m. and you'll find the Zoom link below where you can or you can find it on our website. This morning we'll have an amazing time of worship. We'll share some short announcements and then Clayton will share a message with us. We'll have time of communion together and a closing benediction. Welcome. Good morning everyone and welcome. We know that it's been a tough and challenging week. So let's invite the Holy Spirit into our homes and into our hearts this morning. And we invite you to sing together and worship together with us. This is fullness. Fullness of eternal promise. Stirring in your sons and daughters. Earth revealing heaven's wonders Spirit come, Spirit come What you spoke is now unfolding All your children shall behold it Dreams awaken in this moment Spirit come, Spirit come, and pour it out, let your love run over, here and now, let your glory fill this house, pour it out, let your love run over, here and now. Let your glory fill this house. Sing tongues of fire. Tongues of fire. Testifying of the sun. One desire. Spirit. Spirit come, speak revival, prophesy like it is done, one desire. Spirit come, Spirit come, tongues of fire, testifying of the sun, one desire. I like it is done one desire spirit come spirit come spirit come spirit come let our hearts continue burning for our King is soon returned. 
everyone. My name is Samantha Perfoss, and I'm part of the elder team at Reunion, uh, typically a member of the Somerville location. On behalf of the elders, I wanted to spend a few brief moments of today's gathering to reflect on the events of the past week as we've grappled with the pain of racism and racial injustice in our city and across the nation. We as elders have struggled alongside the reunion staff to make sense of what we're seeing the violence, the hatred, the inflammatory actions of leadership, and why it continues to be so difficult to love our neighbors truly and fully. With each other, with our community groups, we've listened to the pain and heartbreak of our black and brown brothers and sisters, the frustration and anguish and trauma expressed over the last week, and we continue to listen. We've listened and shared the feeling of helplessness as people acknowledge their privilege and then struggle to be helpful in this moment. So we wondered, what does that mean for reunion as a church? What does this mean for each of us as members of the body of Christ? We want to express that it is our belief in that of reunion that there is no room for racism in the body of Christ. We were all created in the image of God, in his beautiful likeness, and he makes it clear in his word that finding unity in diversity is his great vision for the world. And yet it becomes so clear that we are a broken people. What we're seeing now is not new. Black and brown people in this country and beyond have suffered for centuries at the hand of others. And today that racism is baked into our systems, our social structures, and our world. Implicitly or explicitly, our biases are ever-present, and our actions hurt and oppress people we are called to love and protect. This is hard. It's hard to wrestle with. It's hard as a white person to look inward and see how my actions or lack of action could be contributing to oppression. But it's even harder, as a black or brown person in this country, to know that you may be viewed as less worthy of life simply because of the color of your skin. In our prayer meeting this past week, Les Jackson, another elder, prayed that we might see that God did not make this current moment happen. He simply allowed the hearts of men to be revealed. As we continue to see God's revelations around us, as ugly as they may be, it is important that we not lose sight of His plan and His purpose for us all, that we need to face the darkness so that His light might shine. For this reason, we as reunion leaders encourage you to lament. Lament the pain and suffering that we're seeing. We encourage you to mourn. Mourn all the lives that have been lost and the brokenness of our racist systems. And we need to repent, to look deep within ourselves and see how we might be implicitly or explicitly contributing to this brokenness. And we need to move forward in faith, to call upon the words of Micah 6.8, to seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God all of which require action. On behalf of the elders, we see you and we love you. We cry with you and we stand with you. We share our frustrations with you and we also share a sense of urgency. We share our hopes and dreams for a better future and pray that you will continue to walk alongside us in this journey as we continue to walk alongside you. Reunion hopes to be a place where we can all openly and honestly wrestle with all the things that need to be wrestled with right now. We want to be a church where people can be vulnerable, admit their imperfection, enter into the discomfort, be humbled, and listen. We'd encourage you to educate yourself on issues of racial justice and inequality, to talk to your friends. You can find resources in The Loop, our weekly newsletter, and we'll also be starting a new formation community called Be the Bridge, which you'll hear more about in our announcements. And we will also continue to listen to you. Both the elder team and our reunion staff will make ourselves available to anyone who needs to grieve 
share their despair and concerns, and offer suggestions and solutions for how reunion can do better. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being the church. And we love you. Hi, Reunion. Uh, my name is Nate Rubright, and I'm part of the Somerville community. I'm so excited uh, that you have come and joined us this morning online. I want to take a couple moments to highlight a few announcements that we have. First, I want to remind you that you can help support the work and mission of Reunion by giving online. Thank you to everyone who has been generous during this season. We always say this is a get to, not a have to. Uh, it's something you get to participate in as you come to know and love the mission of Reunion. We should have a link in the chat uh, right now, but you can always give online on our website, reunionmovement.com. As you know, we have an I Can Help group that offer to help people who are struggling this season. I want to share and thank uh, some people in that group uh, who gave generously to an opportunity to help a family in our community who was in need. From just this group alone, we were able to raise money uh, to help provide meals for the next month uh, for this family. We know that there's other people in our reunion community uh, who are in need and who are struggling, please reach out to us and let us know your needs. We'd love to be blessing you. All right. We have two big announcements and uh, I have a seventh month old right off screen here. So please, uh, she might chirp in here for a second. Neighboring communities. Last week uh, for Fifth Sunday, we announced three new neighboring communities that we want our community to be a part of. As the coronavirus has continued to affect our city and communities, we want uh, we, as a church, want to mobilize together so we can partner more directly with organizations. We have two neighboring communities focused on helping with food insecurities in our community. The first uh, is with Faith Christian Church in Dorchester that hosts a food pantry every other week on Fridays. They need help packing food at the Greater Boston Food Bank uh, and organizing the food to give to families in need at the church. If you're interested in being part in the rotation to serve, part of the rotation to serve, please text FCC to 617-415-4466. The second neighboring community is with another food pantry in South Medford with Mystic Community Market. Reunion is partnering with them by providing volunteers every Tuesday. If you are interested in being part of the rotation to serve, please text Mystic to 617-415-4466. We are also starting a new neighboring community, partnering with Fostering Hope. Fostering Hope and many of their church partners, including Reunion, have the honor of coming alongside child welfare professionals and advocates to support children and families through a project they are calling the Family Support Initiative. If you want to be a part of this neighboring community to serve or learn more about foster care and adoption, please text FOSTER to 617-415-4466. All right. Uh, our last announcement is about Be the Bridge. Back in March, we announced that Reunion would be creating four types of community, life, connecting, formation, and neighboring. Because we believe that discipleship happens in the context of different spaces and relationships. Most recently, we started a new formation community, and we are excited about the number of people participating. We have 20 people participating uh, in two different emotionally healthy and spirit, in two different emotionally healthy spirituality formation classes, and eight people who are walking together in a grief share community. We see the need for formation communities, and we are excited to offer another one. As our elder Sam just mentioned, we want to give energy and space for our community to have meaningful, con excuse me, meaningful conversations and places of growth, repentance, and reconciliation. If we want to be the church that loves our neighbors and our city, we want to have hard conversations and give people safe spaces to do so. With that in mind, we are starting a new formation community called Be the Bridge. Be the Bridge is a nonprofit organization that partners with churches by creating spaces and providing curriculum for bridge building that focuses on justice and reconciliation. Be the Bridge will help spotlight the stories, concerns, and injustices of marginalized people so that together we can be the bridge towards racial reconciliation. If you are interested in being a part of this new community, please text BRIDGE to 617-415-4466. We don't yet have a start date or time uh, as we want to find a time that works for everyone who is interested. Now, I want to hand things off to Clayton as he continues our series, Become Like Jesus. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Clayton. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, uh, and I'm really glad that you guys are here with us this morning, tuning in as we continue our current series of Sunday morning messages 
uh, throughout which we have been uh, working our way through bit by bit uh, this letter that Paul wrote to, um, to the Philippians. Uh, before we get to our text today, though, I am curious, do you guys remember who Matthew Emmons is? If you do, um, please write that in the, the chat um, over here to the side, but my guess is you probably don't. Matthew Emmons was uh, an American competitive sharpshooter who was one shot away from a gold medal in the 2004 Summer Olympics. And he had done so well at his event, the 50 meter three position rifle, that in order to win on his last shot, he didn't need a bullseye. The only thing he needed to do was hit the target. Uh, it was as close to a sure thing as you can get. And I remember watching him take that shot. I remember the confidence in his face. And then I remember how his face changed when he looked at the scoreboard and saw a zero pop up to, next to his name. And he turned to the officials. He had this look of confusion on his face, sure that someone had made a mistake. And he just kept pointing down range, repeating the words, I shot, I shot. And the truth was a mistake had been made. It just wasn't on the part of the officials. Matthew Emmons was in lane two, but the near perfect bullseye that he had just shot was on the target in lane three. And I remember the look on his face and the collective groan of the crowd when the truth of what had happened kind of dawned on everyone. And instead of cruising to a gold medal, uh, Matthew Emmons went home having secured eighth place at the 2004 Summer Olympics. One of his competitors would, would go on to say that they had never seen that large of a mistake at this level of competition. That at the Olympics, this was incredibly rare. And while that's true, that this level of mistake is incredibly rare in the Olympics, I think it's actually really easy for us to make a similar mistake in our everyday lives. And I think that's what Paul is warning us about uh, in our text for today. Before we turn to our text, though, we have a couple of things um, that I think we need to unpack a little bit and, and engage in some contextual work around uh, first, because there's a couple of ideas that are going to come up that are going to seem really weird to us. Uh, the first one, is this idea of righteousness. Now, righteousness is not a term that we use that often outside of a religious uh, context anymore. And so uh, I think that we've kind of lost uh, a lot of our collective understanding of the meaning of that word. So as you read the Bible, uh, not just as you listen to this message on Sunday morning, but as you actually you know, read the Bible on your own, it may be helpful for you to know uh, whenever you see this word righteousness, that it can almost always be substituted with one of two modern words that we do use, uh, you know, regularly. Often this word can be, you know, juxtaposed or substituted with the word justice. Righteousness can mean justice. Other times, as with our text for today, it actually carries with it this idea of a standard of acceptance uh, or a, a sense of en enoughness, if you will. The second strange concept that our text for today is going to seem to have a bit of a fascination with is circumcision. <laughs> um, you see, it kind of makes sense because Paul is writing to the first Jesus community that he ever started in Eastern Europe. And halfway through this letter, Paul is going to begin to warn them uh, in our text for today. Paul is going to begin to warn them about a group of people who would become uh, known as Judaizers. And, and these Judaizers were Jewish Christians who would follow Paul on his journeys, as he's going from city to city, starting these new churches, um, they would follow him. And as, as soon as he left the city, they would kind of swoop in behind him uh, and they would go to these new uh, Gentile or non-Jewish Christians. And they would say something to the effect of like, I'm so glad that Paul told you about Jesus and got you started. But we're here to tell you that if you want to follow Jesus, you have to become Jewish first. You have to adopt our national identity. You have to adopt our cultural heritage. You have to become like us. You have to think the way that we think. You have to value the things that we value. You have to look the way that we look and dress the way that we dress. You have to eat the things that we eat. And by the way, you have to get circumcised. And to us, this sounds super weird and, and really uncomfortable. Um, but to them, right, in the Old Testament, circumcision was this sign of belonging to God's community, this community of God's people, and in sharing um, his dreams for their future. So basically what they were saying was that Jesus was a really good starting place, but if you really wanted to be confident that you were God's people, uh, that you were sufficient, that you were enough, then you needed 
to look like them. You needed to adopt their heritage. You needed to become like them and, and adopt all these extra things and assimilate into their culture. And Paul's not having it, right? Paul is not messing around. This is what he says. Uh, I'm in Philippians uh, chapter three, beginning in verse two. He says, beware the dogs, beware the evil workers, beware those who mutilate the flesh, right? Referring to circumcision. He says, for we are the circumcision. The ones who worship by the Spirit of God exult in Christ Jesus and do not rely on human credentials. The mind, too, are sufficient. If someone thinks that he has a good reason to put confidence in human credentials, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I lived according to the law as a Pharisee. In my zeal for God, I persecuted the church. And according to righteousness stipulated in the law, I was blameless. Paul is laying out here like his old resume, uh, these these sources of of where he used to find his identity. He says that these are the things that he used to put confidence in. And notice, uh, it's interesting, about half of these things that he just listed are privileges that he was born into. He did not have anything to do with them. He was circumcised on the eighth day, which is a requirement in the Jewish law. He had nothing to do with that. He was born into the nation of Israel and, and what's more into the tribe of Benjamin, which is where Uh, Israel's first king came from. There's a lot of pride and a lot of heritage and a lot of history there, but he didn't have anything to do with that. He says he's a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? A Hebrew's Hebrew with a perfect pedigree, but he didn't have anything to do with that. He then goes on to to lay out some things though that he, he did have something to do with it. He achieved by a lot of hard work. He says he was a Pharisee. You know, that means he was educated. He had a lot of schooling. He was respected Uh, He was a a civic and religious leader in his community. He says that he was so passionate about what he thought God wanted wanted from him uh, that he persecuted the church. And then finally, he says that according to the law, the 613 commands in the Jewish scriptures, he was blameless. That's an impressive list of credentials. But then he goes on as if something changed for him. Something happened to make him realize that he had been shooting with spectacular aim at the wrong target his whole life. This is what he says uh, in verse seven. He says, but these assets, right? This list of credentials, this list of, of sources of enoughness, these assets I have come to regard as liabilities because of Christ. More than that, I now regard all things as liabilities compared to the far greater value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered all things. Indeed, I regard them as dung that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness derived from the law, right? Not having an identity or a sense of enoughness derived from the things that he's done. But because I have a righteousness and enoughness that comes by way of Christ's faithfulness, a righteousness from God that is in fact based on Christ's faithfulness. My aim, my target that I'm shooting at now is to know him to experience the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings, and to be like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. I want to point out that this guy, Paul, his life is not just a Bible story, right? This is a historical figure who at one point in his life was persecuting Christians, right? Persecuting the church. But at another point in his life, he is the most successful church planter, church starter alive. And I, wanna, I want you to think about for a minute what makes someone's life change so dramatically. Our text today points to, to two segments in Paul's life, right? One where his privilege and his pride and his heritage and his credentials gave him a sense of identity and enoughness. And one where he has gladly given up those things. He even describes them as dung, saying basically that he would gladly flush those things down the toilet for something that is immeasurably greater. Now, Paul didn't have a toilet, but, you know, contextualizing. And in between those two segments, the dramatic turning point in Paul's own account of things was coming face to face with Jesus after he had risen from the dead. I think that this text today has has two really big challenges for us. Firstly, I think that every one of us needs to assess where we receive our sense of value, our sense of identity, our sense of enoughness. And as a tool to help us do that, I want everyone to think through 
uh, these six questions. And I'll tell you first, this is probably gonna be pretty uncomfortable for you if you really engage with this. But if you're taking notes, you should probably write these down. The first question I have for you is, what do you want others to notice about you? Second question is, what do you hope people say about you when you're not around? What about you when disrespected or overlooked provokes the most anger in you? If you're being really, really honest, what do you fudge the truth about? When do you feel the most insecure? And finally, what are you the most afraid of losing? And my hope is that these questions will help expose for you deep down where you look for your sense of enoughness and acceptance. What are the credentials that you, you may be clinging to? The second challenge that I think our text for today has for us is to assess not just where we're getting our sense of enoughness, but assess the image that we have of Jesus. Reflecting on Paul's image of Jesus, does your picture of Jesus make your credentials, make your other sources of enoughness pale in comparison? And I think that's a question for all of us, right? Whether you're a new Christian or you've been following Jesus for years, because that answer is not static. That's going to change from day to day. But along with these challenges, as uncomfortable as they can be, I think our text is calling us to a new and higher kind of freedom. And I'll explain what I mean by that by sharing part of my experience from the last couple of weeks as an example. As I work through these questions, I realize that I care way too much about what other people think of me. I get way too much of my identity, my enoughness from people thinking that I'm smart or that I'm insightful or that I'm hardworking. And so when the events of the last couple of weeks call into question and, and call to mind my privilege, right, the areas in my life that I started way ahead of other people simply because of the color of my skin, it's easy for something deep down inside of me to feel as though my source of identity, my enoughness is at risk. But if my image of Jesus shows those credentials, those sources of identity to actually be liabilities, and if my image of Jesus uh, shows that my value is never actually derived from those things, then I'm actually set free from those things. And I'm now free to listen. I'm free to not be defensive. I'm free to ask and, and understand the stories of other people and empathize with them from a place of humility and grace and love. Look, you're going to settle for a lot of things in life. You're going to settle on what school you go to. You're going to settle on what job you take. You're going to settle on what house you rent or buy. You're going to settle on the next job that you take. But please, please do not settle on the Jesus that you pledge your allegiance to. If there's one thing that I want for you and that I think Paul wants for you, it is for you to know the Jesus that Paul knows. It's to know the Jesus that makes every credential and every inferior source of identity seem like extra weight that needs to be cut loose to free us up to pursue something immeasurably better. In just a minute, we're going to go into a time of communion. So if you need to go grab elements for that, now is a good time to do that. Uh, but today, as we come face to face with a physical representation of who Jesus is, I want you to use this time to reflect on the Jesus that Paul knew, the Jesus that turned his life upside down, the Jesus that made every source of identity seem hollow and false, and the Jesus who made it possible for Paul to let go of those credentials and made it possible for him to embrace a new kind of freedom. Let's pray. God, forgive us for the false idols that we elevate and we venerate in place of you. Forgive us for the deafness and the blindness and the defensiveness and the jealousy that those idols implant in us. God, give us clarity to see the things that have our hearts. Give us the courage to let go of those things 
and the clarity to see you for who you really are, as well as the determination not to settle for anything less. That we love you and we thank you for who you are. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You can take communion whenever you're ready. Friends, the events of the past month have left all of us reeling. We're mourning, angry, hurt, confused, sad, and everything in between. Yet we are resolved. We're resolved to condemn, to condemn racism and systemic racism that is so deeply rooted in our nation, our churches, and our lives. We're resolved to lament, to lament, mourn, and walk through this together as a family. We're resolved to cry, 
to cry together, to pray together, and to work towards justice and equality together. We're resolved to listen, to listen well to the voices, lives, and experiences of our black and brown brothers and sisters, because black lives matter. We're resolved to resource and equip our community to have the hard discussion necessary to move forward. And we're resolved to be a community, a community committed to the ministry of reconciliation Christ gave to us. Our elders are going to close us this morning in a prayer of benediction, a prayer of lament, repentance, and hope in the face of despair. Our community response will be, O oh Lord, only you can make all things new. Lord Jesus, your kingdom is good news for a world caught in racial hostility. We ask that you would give us grace for the deep challenges facing our country. Lord, we confess our anger, our deep sadness, and our collective sense of weakness to see this world healed through our own strength. Lord, we confess that our country has a long history of racial oppression and that racism has been a strategy of evil powers and principalities. Lord, we confess that the gospel is good news for the oppressed and the oppressor. Both are raised up, both are liberated, but in different ways. The oppressed are freed from the harsh burden of inferiority. The oppressor from the destructive illusion of superiority. Lord, we confess that the gospel is your power to form a new people, not identified by dominance and superiority, but by unity in the spirit. Lord, we ask that you would help us name our part in this country's story of racial oppression and hostility, whether we have sinned against others by seeing them as inferior or whether we have been silent in the face of evil. Forgive us of our sin. Lord, we pray for our enemies, for those who allow satanic powers to work through them. Grant them deliverance through your mighty power. Lord, we ask that you would form us to be peacemakers. May we be people who speak truth in love as we work for our reconciled world. Lord, we commit our lives to you, believing that you are working in the world in spite of destructive powers and principalities. Bring healing to those who are hurt, peace to those who are anxious, and love to those who are fearful. We wait for you. O oh Lord, make haste to help us.